All right, so today we are going to talk about building web apps in Java. And it sounds like everyone here is either a Java developer or aspiring Java developer, so you're in the right place. Is anyone here currently kind of working on the web mostly? Mm -hmm. Yeah? I guess everyone kind of more or less has to do something on the web every once in a while anyway. So we're going to take a look at one way that we can build uh, web apps in Java, which is pretty cool. It's a pretty unique way of building apps. Uh, first things first, I promise to introduce myself a little bit better now that I'm up here. Uh, my name is Marcus. I work as a lead developer advocate at a company called Vaadin. I'm originally from Finland, so I'm kind of familiar with the darkness and the cold and the beer and the hockey and all of the <laughs> stuff here. <laughs> uh, that said, I've moved to California about six years ago, so I'm I've grown weak. I've, it feels cold outside now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, anyway, so my job is essentially I go around to, to different meetups and conferences. I do online content, just try to get people aware of VOD and help them get started, listen to their complaints, and make sure that our dev team fixes things and builds the right new stuff. Today, we're going to cover essentially two things. We're going to look at a very quick introduction to VOD and just kind of the four core concepts that we need to understand before we get to coding. And then we'll essentially spend the rest of the time in our ID building an app from scratch and just seeing how it works. Kind of going around uh, talking to developers, I've realized that the best language for explaining stuff to a developer is through code. Because like if I can show you in code how it works, then there are, it kind of just makes more sense. So, Vaadin, um, besides our one customer who came over here, hello, uh, is there anyone else here who is actively using Vaadin at the moment? All right, very good, so a lot of new potential here. Um, for those who are not familiar with Vaadin, it's a set of UI components and tools that allow you to build web apps in Java. Our main focus is on productivity, so we want you as developers to be productive when you are building these web applications. What we really want to achieve is that we want to give you the tools that allow you to build really great user interfaces for your end users. So we want to enable you to build really great UX for the end users by giving you a whole lot of tools and components that automate a lot of the kind of difficult to do right things. Throughout our history, we've always been a Java shop. We have always tried to kind of merge together these two huge ecosystems, the Java ecosystem and the web. So we want people to be, uh, Java developers to be able to build apps in a language that they know and like and still be able to publish to this huge ecosystem, which is the web. So at the core of everything in Vaadin, we have this big set of UI components, kind of all the different building blocks you would need when you're building an app from simple things like text fields and buttons all the way up to like data grids and things like that. We have uh, built all of these components uh, mobile first. We've paid a lot of attention to things like accessibility, making sure that people with screen readers can use them. You can navigate them with your keyboard and so on. So we give you a very high level of standard kind of uh, uh, when you get started. We've also made these themable. So we'll take a look at this later. But essentially, uh, you can choose different parameters, configure uh, parameters, which will make these kind of fit into your look and feel so they don't feel like they're completely out of place when you're building an app for your company. All the components that we have are built using a new set of web standards called web components. So essentially what we're doing is we're defining new HTML tags for the browser. So that means that these components that we have are also usable to essentially any front-end developer if they just wanted to use these. Of course, since we are here today at a Java meetup, we're going to take a look at our own Java framework that uses these components. When you use this framework, it gives you two things. It gives you a Java API for them, a component-based API, and it gives you automated uh, communication between the server and the browser. So essentially, it means that you don't need to do any kind of requests and responses. You don't need to uh, deal with serializing data or anything. You just define in Java how your UI should look and behave, and all the rest will be automated by the framework. You can easily extend the framework. We're also going to take a look at that in a little while. Uh, 
I guess this slide is only for, for you there. <laughs> um, uh, we did a little architectural overhaul uh, lately. Essentially, we had a fairly monolithic structure before where all these components and the Java connection were all kind of one big package. So if you wanted to use our data grid, it meant you had to kind of buy into using the whole framework. Now we've split these into two. So if you look at the examples later on our website, you'll notice that for every component, we'll list how to use it from HTML or how to use it through the Java API. So it's essentially it. Uh, Wadden is an open source product. Uh, it's Apache 2 license. So everything that we're going to take a look at today is something that you can just go home and try and use, and you don't have to pay us anything for it. It's really widely used, I think, around Last time we checked, around 40% of Fortune 100 companies are using it. We have a roughly 150,000 developers in our uh, community of developers. So it's a fairly well uh, used framework, especially when it comes to like larger enterprise type of applications where uh, this kind of dynamic uh, type safe way of building UIs makes a lot of kind of sense. All right, I've been talking for several minutes and there's still no code, let's fix that. So before we get to the actual live coding, I want to just go through a couple of core concepts to make, make it a little bit easier to follow along. Like I mentioned, everything in Vaadin is a component. So if you want a button, you would instantiate a button object. If you want to have a date picker, you instantiate a date picker. And the same applies to more kind of low-level HTML uh, things. Like if you wanted to span, you could instantiate a span component. You can then decide how you want to have these components laid out by putting them into a layout. So in, our, in a very simple example, a vertical layout would just put all the components on top of each other. Horizontal layout would put them next to each other. And if you used any of the kind of more advanced layouts, you would get more advanced functionality. Essentially, that's the idea, though. Uh, of course, just putting components on the screen isn't really enough. We need to add some functionality to our application. The way we do that is by listening to events. So any user interface component a user can interact with in any way will trigger events when those things happen. So a button, we could add a click listener to it and then decide what to do when that button gets clicked. In this case, we take the value from the text field, we add it to the layout underneath, and that's it. Uh, any component that we make, we can map to a URL in the browser by adding a route annotation on it. Typically, you would add a route annotation on a layout where you could then define the kind of uh, the entire view. These can be nested. They can have parameters that you can capture and so on. Another part of building larger applications is uh, binding data. So typically when we're building UIs, we have some sort of data that we got from our database or from a REST API or somewhere, and we want to put that in a form. We want to do validations, things like that. In this very simple example, what I have is a inline person class here with some constraints like not empty and email. I have two text fields for the same name and email, and then I'm using this uh, binder class here, which binds those uh, fields to the uh, properties on that person object. In this uh, kind of convention-based uh, way that I'm using right here, it'll look at the names and match by them. If you want to be more explicit, you can tell, like, I want to bind this text field to this object. I want to do these validations and, and so on. All right. And then finally, if we have a lot of data, we want to show a listing of it. Uh, we can just either pass in a collection, a list of objects uh, to something like a data grid and have those displayed. If we have a lot of data, we can use a callback uh, interface, which will transparently just keep calling a function that you can then defer to your backend database or REST or some, some other place where you want to fetch more data from. To the end user, the experience will be exactly the same. As they keep scrolling, it just appear as if they have just a, like an infinite data set. Very cool. So just can Does it call run on the server side? Or on the yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. Oh. But yeah, essentially it is. So um, kind of wrapping up the core concepts here. Uh, in Vaadin, you work with components. Everything is a component. You lay out these components by putting them into layouts. You add interaction to this by listening for events. And you do all of this in Java. All right. So the app we're going to build today is a reactive chat application. So we're it's going to look something like this. We want to have a header here, a 
area for messages, then we want to have an input layout where we can put in our messages, and then obviously we want the messages to be reflected in real time to all the other connected clients. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Spring Boot for the base of the application, and then we're going to use Vaadin for the UI, and then we're going to use Project Reactor for the reactive stuff. I will give a link to the GitHub repo after this, so you don't need to like keep a whole lot of notes if you don't want to, and I understand we have a YouTube recording on, on the way as well, so let's jump into code. Let's see here. Please turn on mirroring, maybe. Hold on. There we go. Okay. All right, so we'll keep this up here as our kind of spec. This is what we're aiming to do. Let's make it a little bit bigger. I, I'm going to start my project here on, I'm on bottom.com slash start, and I'm gonna download a project base with Spring. This will allow me to put in some uh, default stuff like the group ID and app name. Essentially, what this is going to give us is the same as if we went to the Spring Initializer, except that the Spring Initializer doesn't have any kind of body and example code baked in. So if you prefer using the Initializer, you can, you can use that as well, but we'll use this. So uh, call this bot in chat. We'll download it, open it. Then once you win your IntelliJ license, you can open it in IntelliJ. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have it here. Let's have that. And then the most important thing in the beginning is getting the font size right. Let's see. Every, everyone can see that in the back too? Yep. All right, so let's just briefly look at what we have in here. Like I said, we have a Spring Boot application. We have uh, the bottom dependency pulled in here. And we have Spring Boot DevTools, which is going to reload the application as we're developing, so it'll be a little bit smoother. And then I'll add a Project Reactor dependency here so that we get that. In terms of source code, we don't have a whole lot. We have a, let's see here. There we go. So we have a main view. Like I said, uh, it's mapped to an empty route. In this case, this would be equal to having route, uh, just an empty route, so it's mapped to the context route. Uh, it's a vertical layout, so again, re recapping what we learned, it puts everything just on top of each other. We have an empty Spring Boot application class that launches this, and let's tr make sure that this works. So just take out some of this code. We'll put in a H1 here, new H1. Nope. Yes. And then, hello. And we can just, by calling add, we're just adding this to the vertical layout. We can remove the message bean here and then just run this. So IntelliJ already notices that we're in a Spring Boot application, so it just uh, suggests us to run the application class here. All right, so that'll Start up, go into the browser, hit localhost 8080, see hello Toronto. We'll turn on live reload here, which will hopefully then reload the application as we're, as we're going along. All right, so let's take a real quick look at what we're aiming to do. The way I wanna tackle this problem is that we're gonna kind of scaffold out the UI first. We're kind of put everything in place as far as we can until we get to a point where we need the backend in order to go forward. At that point, we'll jump into the backend and implement everything that we need there, and then we'll finish up the application. So we'll start by just kind of putting all the main building blocks in place and making sure that we get everything where we need it. So instead of adding, all right, let me just fix that. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do here is if you look at the kind of layout here, you can see everything is centered, so we'll call set default alignment to center. The other thing I wanna do is set the size to full. What that essentially means is that we want the layout to 
expand all the way to the bottom of our browser window here. The reason being that we want to put this input layout here at the bottom. By default, the layout would only grow as much as needed based on the components that we put in there, which is not what we want in this case. All right. Uh, then we'll add a new h1 tag, button chat. Let's see, like that. Let's call this header. And then for the header, I'm going to use this theming API that I mentioned. So there are two variants that we ship with, a light one and a dark one. If we switch this to the dark one, it's going to invert the colors and give us this API. So we're going to... What's going on here? All right. So we're just going to add dark to the theme list, and then we'll add the header to our code. All right, so we'll run this real quick make this a little bit narrower, we might actually be even able to kind of see both of these at the same time, maybe. All right, so it doesn't look exactly the way we want it. Uh, one thing that we can do in an application, in a modern application is add a style sheet. So let's add a style sheet where we can configure a little bit how things look. We'll open up this and then in our styles directory here, we'll create a new file, <coughs> styles.css. No, it doesn't, hold on. Apparently IntelliJ isn't very good at noticing when I, I removed the previous one that I had and then I opened up a new one with the same name and it thinks all the same files are still there even though they're not. All right, so styles.css. All right, and then we're for main layout h1. So for the h1, we'll set uh, set the width to 100%, margin to zero, padding to 16 pixels, like that. See, all right, we'll run this again. Hopefully that'll take care of it. Nope. What's going on here? Oh yeah. Of course we need to call add class name main view. So that way. All right, once we have the header in place, the next logical thing that we want to do is ask the user who are you? So kind of identify the user and uh, so we know what uh, who they are. So we'll uh, <coughs> gonna split this into a method of its own. Hello. I'll call ask username, and I'll have my ID, uh, excuse me, uh, have my ID implement the method. For the ask username here, the UI looks something like this. So we have a text field, and then we have a button next to each other. So if you remember, now we're inside of a vertical layout, which meant that if we put both of those components just straight into the layout, they're just going to be on top of each other. So what we need to do is we need to nest a horizontal layout inside of it. Create a new. Horizontal layout, call this, let's make that smaller, call this username layout, and then we'll add that horizontal layout to our main layout. Inside of this, we want to add that text field and the button, so we'll create a new text field, call this username field, and we'll add a new button. <coughs> Call this start button, give it a caption, and then we'll call uh, username layout.add and both of those, so username field and start button. All right, let's build it, go back to our browser and see if we're making some headway. What is going on with this? Did I? Uh huh. So yeah, I forgot to say this is a group exercise. If you see me doing something incredibly <laughs> stupid, uh, this one's on you. <laughs> All right, I'll. Uh, mob programming. Yeah, mob programming. That's a good one. 
Oh, look, it worked. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so we're uh, pretty much uh, right here now. The next thing we want to do is capture that username uh, information when somebody hits the start chatting button. If you uh, remember, anyone remember how we do that? Take the start button and we add a click listener to it so that way we get notified whenever somebody clicks on it. Click like that. In here, what we want to do is first of all, we get this username field. We get the value from it. We'll take that value, stick it into a field. Hmm? What did I do? Oh, no, that's the, yeah. I'm a super lazy typer, so I, I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts to have IntelliJ do most of the heavy lifting. Uh, once we have that uh, username safely stored, we essentially don't need this username layout anymore. So what we can do is we can call remove username layout. So we'll just kind of trash it. We don't need it anymore. And instead, we will call another method here. Uh, let's call it show, show chat. Here we're going to build the other part of this. All right, so we'll build this. And then we'll try to figure out what do you think will happen if we hit the start chatting button right now. What do we expect will happen? Yes. All right. So we, we called remove. Presumably, we have the username uh, stored somewhere in the field. Uh, and we have an empty field here now, or an empty screen. All right. So we'll uh, get to the next part. Uh, it looks something like this. So in the middle, we have an area where we want to have all the chat messages. We have a requirement for that. Uh, that is, whenever we add a component, uh, new message there, we want that to always get scrolled into view, so we don't want the chat messages just to kind of disappear. So we need to add a little bit of extra logic to take care of that. And the other requirement we have is that we want the input layout to be at the bottom here. So again, we'll start by just putting the components there. Then we'll take care of kind of making them the right size and everything. So I'll create a new component. This is a kind of a common pattern you'll see in modern applications is that you take basic components that we ship with, you extend them, and then you add some own logic to them. So we'll create a new one called it message list. Whoa. Message list, then we'll implement it. Here I will extend just a plain div. Uh, that one. Essentially, we don't have a whole lot of requirements for this. It's just going to be a container, but it needs to scroll to the bottom. So we'll override the constructor here. We'll add a class name, message list, so that we can go in here and set uh, the overflow y to scroll. and. While I'm at it, I'll just make this. Nope. So we'll make this 100% white as well. And then I already know that I'm going to put in paragraphs in here for the, for the content. So we'll do message list paragraph and set that to be 100% white as well. All right. So we have the style. So now we know that it will scroll. Uh, but of course, it doesn't scroll just by itself. We'll need to kind of instruct to do it. So what we're going to override from the default behavior of a div is when we call add, we want to first let the superclass just do its thing and add the components here. But what we want to do then is we want to take the last component that was passed in, get the element, and call a function. So this is something that's new in VOD in 10 plus. I don't know if you've used it, but essentially we're giving you kind of access. By calling get element, you essentially get the underlying DOM element, which means that we can, in this case, we're calling a, a JavaScript function on that element. So this is one way we can kind of hook into the underlying stuff uh, uh, if we ever run into a situation where the component that we're trying to uh, use doesn't have whatever functionality we need. So here we'll call scroll uh, into view, which is a JavaScript API, which will ensure that it gets scrolled into view. All right, so that's it. Just a div 
which takes uh, the last uh, added component and makes sure that that gets scrolled into view. So then we'll add the message list and then we'll create a input layout. I'm essentially just splitting this into a probably unnecessarily many pieces just to be a little bit clearer. Here again, very similar to what we did for the, uh, for the username layout here. We have a text field and a button next to each other. So we create a uh, new horizontal layout. This time we'll call this input layout. We'll return the input layout. In here we'll have the text field for the message. And then we have a send button. And again, we add, uh-oh, typing too fast for my own good here. All right, so we'll take the input layout. We add both of those to it. So the message field, send button. All right, a lot of typing again. Let's hit play here and see, see what happens. So we'll start chatting and kind of see that we we have all the pieces, bits and pieces here, but it's not really looking the way we want it to. First of all, this should probably be as wide as the screen, and also it should be all the way here at the bottom. The button was supposed to be blue, and so on. So we'll uh, fix some of these things. The way we'll push uh, this to the bottom and the way we make this text field bigger than the button is through the same API. Uh, called expand. So expand essentially tells the layout which component should kind of get all the extra space that's not needed by other components. So if we call expand on message list, that tells Vaadin that the message list should just kind of gobble up everything else. And in the process of doing that, it's going to push the uh, other component all the way down until it hits, hits bottom. So we'll do same thing here, input layout dot uh, expand on message field. In order for this to have any effect, the input layout needs to be as wide as the window. So this is an alternative if you don't feel like writing CSS, you want to do something like sets width or something, you can do it through the Java API as well. All right, and then the button, we wanted it to be blue. That's essentially a theme variant that we have for a primary button. Usually something that you want to highlight to the user that this is the primary action that we expect you to take. Uh, so we'll call this a, all right, so we'll build this. And uh, yeah, there's a, in the newest Vaadin 12, there's a much more convenient API for setting this. I didn't have time to update it, but it would essentially be set, uh, send button dot set the invariant, and then there's a, enum of different theme variants, so you don't have to kind of know these magical strings anymore. All right, so it's all the way here at the bottom. We have a blue button. Everything kind of looks very similar to our spec, so that's a good thing. All right, so now we're essentially as far as we can go uh, on this UI before we uh, can go any further. We need to have some place where we can send the messages and kind of handle all of that. So we'll, we'll create a little bit of backend code here for that. I'm sorry? No placeholder, no placeholder data. We're, we're going to do this properly. All right, so uh, I'll create a new class here. It's going to be a POJO for a chat message. It'll have information from who it was from, uh, when it was sent, what the message was. So we'll, we'll create that. Then in our application class, we'll configure a couple of beans. We'll just use Spring here. The way I want to kind of lay this out is that we'll have a central place where every kind of chat client can push their message. And this will kind of broadcast it out to all the connected clients. And they can then kind of do whatever they need with them. So first of all, we'll have a unicast processor for these chat messages. This will be the central place where we put things. Call this, it's called publisher. And this will return just a new dot create. That's what I wanted to do. 
The other part that we want is something that our chat clients can uh, subscribe to to get notified. The unicast processor essentially does what we want, but it has a limitation of only letting one thing listen to it. So if we kind of pipe in a flux in between, flux being kind of a, a thing that can return multiple times. So, so instead of us just returning a value once, which is kind of a snapshot of that value in time, we can give something back, which will just keep returning over and over again whenever something happens. So we'll create a flux of chat messages and then just uh, inject in this unicast processor here. Uh, I'm not sure. And here what we return is publisher.replay. So we'll, in this simple example, we'll just replay the last 30 messages. So if somebody comes late to the uh, game, they'll get at least a little bit of chat history. And then we'll call auto connect, which essentially uh, what it does is it uh, kind of defers all this setup until somebody actually does the somebody actually wants to listen in on this. If I remember correctly, this is where I Spring Boot Dev Tools doesn't want to work, so I'll restart the server as that's going on. Um, while it's going on, we'll uh, go into our main view and auto wire in these two things. So we'll have our unicast processor of chat messages, and then we'll have the flux of chat messages. We will bind these to fields so we'll have access to them. There we go. And what we can do then here is on our send button, we can again add a click listener. And what we want to do when somebody clicks on this is we want to essentially get the value from the message field. We want to create a new chat message and push it to that publisher. So we'll call publisher to, uh, on next. And then we'll create a new chat message. This takes in two things, the username who sent it that we already have because that we saved when the user came in. Then the message will be the message field's value. Once we have sent that message, what we can do is we can go ahead and clear that field for them uh, so that they don't have to kind of backspace all of this stuff out. So we'll call message field clear. It's also nice if we call message field focus so that way their focus goes right back in there and they can continue typing. Actually, it would be pretty nice UX if we did that from the get-go. So whenever the user just comes in, they can just start angrily typing in here to win, win arguments faster. Should we set caps lock on the photos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, build this, go into our application, and see what's, uh, what's going on. All right. Start chatting. Again, we'll type something in here. What do we expect to happen? Oh, it got cleared and it got focused. So again, presumably things went well. We still haven't been able to verify that the username got saved, but presumably since it didn't blow up on us, it, it did. <laughs> um, all right, good. So we're, uh, we're making progress. The next thing uh, is to actually listen for those messages coming in and displaying them. We will do that in here. So once we've created up our UI, we'll take those, that flux and we will call subscribe on it. Subscribe will get called whenever a new message comes in. And again, this is a demo app, so probably in the real life you wouldn't want to have this kind of triggered 30 times. Anytime somebody comes in, you would kind of fetch the history up until now and then subscribe after that. But for the sake of Simplicity, this is what's going to happen today. All right, so once a message comes in, we'll call message uh, list. We'll call add with a new paragraph because that's what we made the CSS for. In there, we'll take the message dot get from. We'll uh, put in a little separator there and then message dot get message. And we'll Keep it simple, just like who sent it and what, what was the message. We'll, again, build this. Go in here, demo, type in something, hello. And it shows up here. All right. This looks good. Let's, uh, obviously, talking to yourself is 
it's kind of fun. A lot of people out here seem to be enjoying it. So, uh, <laughs> but um, but let's see if we can add another chat client here. So we'll go to localhost 8080. It'll be demo two. We'll start chatting. We can see that the replay worked. We did get the history up until now. And obviously, I. I I disagree strongly with this statement from before. And this broke. So there's something that we still need to take care of. Uh, there's one kind of obvious thing that we need to take care of and one less obvious thing that we need to take care of. Uh, by default, Vaadin just uses a standard XHR AJAX request kind of response model for uh, doing these updates. So whenever we click a button, uh, message gets sent to the server, it figures out what happened, then it updates the UI based on that. Now with a chat like this, when I'm updating the UI state from here, essentially what I want to do is the server should notify this other browser window that, hey, something happened. So we need to take care of that. Can anyone think of a, a good way that we could accomplish that? WebSocket, Web that's a good thing, yep. So we'll. We'll enable a WebSocket in Vaadin. You do that by adding this uh, push annotation. They'll tell Vaadin that when somebody comes in, uh, try to establish a push uh, socket. If that fails, it'll go through a whole kind of list of fallbacks. And at the end of the day, the end user experience will be the same, even if it might be a little bit longer, the, the delay. The less kind of obvious thing that we need to fi uh, fix here is that since this chat message comes essentially from a separate thread, from a different thread is updating the UI. Button doesn't like you updating the UI from a separate thread without you kind of explicitly saying like, hey, I know what I'm doing, like let me do this. So there's a access method that we can use to kind of pass in a command and that will be run in a, in a kind of thread safe manner because potentially somebody could be angrily typing in here at the exact same time and we could run into weird situations. So what we'll do is here on the subscribe, uh, actually here, when we actually change the UI, this is the only part that we need to uh, lock. So we'll call get UI. The UI is essentially the central uh, instance of a bot application. It's the browser window, if you will. Uh, we'll call if present. Uh, because if this component wasn't added to the UI yet, it wouldn't essentially have an associated UI. So that's kind of kind of a bummer that we need to do that. But anyway, UI.access, this is the thing that takes in the runnable. And in here, we can do, do things in a safe manner. So we'll move all of this in here. Uh, what did I do? That looks, looks OK, maybe. All right, let's see if that worked. Demo, start chatting. I might need to restart my server here. Let's see. Yeah, let's restart the server. Essentially, if everything goes well now, what's going to happen is that when, when we come into the application, Vaadin will establish that WebSocket. And it's going to happen for both of these windows, so we'll get these up next to each other, like that, demo, we'll refresh here, demo two. Now we can see that this message gets automatically pushed to all the clients that are open, so if we open up more, the same thing would apply. All right. Very cool. So we built an application. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's, let's go back to our slides and figure out what just happened. First of all, uh, if you want to poke around the code a little bit kind of on your own time, you can find it here. Um, I can post this link to the Meetup page as well so you don't have to take a picture of it if you don't want to. Of course, if you want to take a picture and frame that or anything, that's, that's completely <laughs> fine. <laughs> All right, so uh, if, if you're really perceptive during this thing, you might have noticed that, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll sit down. I don't want to be blocking here. You might have noticed that we were writing Java and things happen in the browser, so there are probably some HTML involved there. 
So what was like what happened in between? Like what kind of sorcery <laughs> was involved in doing this? Um, essentially, how a Vaadin application works, kind of high level, kind of little pseudo code, but the essential basics are this: when a user comes in, uh, a Vaadin, uh, the Vaadin server will provide it with a Bootstrap page that it creates. That Bootstrap page will load essentially those web components definitions for the components that you use. So in our case, the text field and the button and the vertical layout and so on. Um, the themes for it, so they look nice. And then it loads this kind of rendering engine, if you will. So we're not shipping a transpiled version of your application to be run in the browser, but we're sending a small piece of JavaScript that knows how to talk to the server and how to create DOM based on instructions from the server. So it's a kind of a thin client, if you will. In that first message is also the first render instruction, which will be create these two components here. So uh, we interact with this. We'll, I'll put in my name. I click the button. And in pseudocode, it's not this verbose in real life, what happens is that this uh, JavaScript in the browser figures out what just happened. Uh, well, the button was clicked, so that we need to send over. Also, the value for this text field changed, so we'll send that over at the same time. Bun will uh, take in this message. It will kind of look at what happened. It will first update the values that it saw had changed. So it will update the text field value. And then it will run the events. So in this case, it will trigger this click uh, listener. And in there, we can call this notification.show. And when we call name.getValue, we're assured that it's already set there. So we can access it as if it had been kind of running on the server. Again, what happens is that Vaadin figures out, like, since our last time we updated the UI, what has changed? It basically takes a diff and sends over, like, hey, this is the only thing that changed. Uh, you need to add a new notification component. Its value should be high, Marcus. And then the JavaScript in the browser will take care of uh, actually creating the DOM and inserting it into the right place and so on. So that's kind of the basic kind of high level of how a Vaadin application works. Uh, kind of main takeaways is that the Java code that you write runs in the JVM. Uh, we don't generate HTML templates that we pass back and forth. We instead send these very kind of small render instructions. Because they're handled centrally by Vaadin, it means that we can also switch over uh, to a different protocol like WebSockets pretty easily. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of the other kind of benefits that we get from, from this all right, so just a quick recap of some of the other features that you get. Uh, well, we already talked about the automated communication. So again, you can use the uh, web sockets. And if you do, you remember to use the access method. One thing that we didn't really discuss is that you can, these two are kind of equal. You would, like by writing that Java code, uh, you will have the exact same code running in the browser as if you had written the HTML for the HTML API. Uh, Vaadin has support for you kind of mixing and matching between declarative and imperative styles. So a lot of times how that works out is that your designer gives you this HTML template, like this is the main layout of the application. It needs to look like that. You're like, all right, all right, fine, let's do it. And then you just kind of plug in where the view goes. You can generate forms and stuff in in Java in there. So you can kind of mix and match between these two styles. Um, like I mentioned, and we kind of briefly looked at this, Bond has a support for theming. Let's take a look at a more uh, real life example of that. So we'll mirror again here. Close this. I will open up one of our demo apps. Uh, bakery flow. The bakery app is essentially our little demo app that just shows all the components in a kind of natural environment for them just so you can get a better sense for the types of applications that you would be able to build with this. So kind of very standard business app. You have a lot of, a lot of forms and fields and lots of data. Uh, if we open up the inspector here, sorry, taking a quick step away from Java land. If, you're, if you don't want to see HTML, you can close your eyes for a second. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, the one thing that we can, uh, oh man, this, let's see if this works better. Yeah, I don't know. Stupid, all right. Some very expensive uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got to make our money somehow, dude. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so we'll uh, let's take a quick look at one of these components. Just to kind of let you see. So you can see like what's running in the browser is exactly this bot and text field component that we had from, from before. But the theming API is something that's pretty cool. So if we set the theme here to dark, this is essentially the same thing that we did in our application for that header, but now I'm setting it for the entire application. What happens is that it applies to every single component in our application. So you can see that it applied to everything. Um, also exposes a whole bunch of these different CSS uh, properties that we can change. So let's take a look at something like border radius. So right now you can maybe perhaps see there's like a very, very slight little roundness to those corners, but we could like go crazy and have it like be super round like that. Or we could maybe go and have it just super square if we wanted to. We can also, uh, change things like colors. So if we take some of the base colors like uh, here, we can change the entire kind of component set in one go. So if we wanted to have a nice purple UI. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I forgot to say that I'm not, I'm not a designer. I'm not authorized to show this when our designers are in the room, but he's. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea. So but the idea, fun to watch them have yeah, a yeah. <laughs> the the idea though is that you can by changing these parameters, you can make the component set look very close to what you need it to be, and then you can add some own, your own CSS on top of it. In addition to these two variants, uh, light and dark, we also ship with a material design uh, theme. So if you're if you're really into material design, you can do that as well. Like I mentioned, all the components are accessible. We've spent a lot of time ensuring that they work nice with keyboards, with screen readers and such. It's obviously a nice thing to do for everyone, but if you're working in big companies, financial government stuff, it's not a nice to have feature. It's something that's kind of a baseline requirement for anything that you're building. Uh, the architecture that we have where the app is running on the server and essentially what's running in the browser is a thin client is very strong from a security perspective because essentially you're not exposing any of the app internals to the uh, external world. So any amount of looking into that rendering engine is not going to really tell anyone too much inter interesting stuff about your application. It's not going to expose any rend endpoints or anything else. It actually goes a little bit further and does kind of basic sanity checks on data. So for instance, you say you have a crud view where only admins can delete stuff and some uh, smart guy was kind of uh, just recording all the traffic and figured out what the message should be to trigger this button. Uh, if they sent that to the server uh, and weren't the admin, what would happen is that button notices that like an invisible button is trying to get triggered and just throw an invalid state exception. So it's kind of, it, it knows what should be doable and what shouldn't be doable at any, any given time. So this is the reason why Botan is kind of very heavily used in, in like financial and healthcare and government and other places as well. In addition to the fact that we have a fairly stable API, again, this stems from the fact that we've kind of put a very strict API separation between the Java API that you work in as developers and then how we implement that API in the browser. So if you think about like a button as a concept doesn't change all that much over time. So when we started out, 18 years ago, the buttons API in Java is essentially exactly the same as it is today. But the way we've implemented that in the browser has changed several, several times over the years. And like I mentioned, now it's using these uh, latest kind of uh, web standards for web components. But that gives you kind of a way of building modern web applications without having to kind of rebuild them every six or so months or however often front end frameworks tend to break their APIs. Also, since Botan does run on the JVM, it's uh, unlike, say, if you've ever used like Google Web Toolkit back in the day, uh, that kind of transpiled into, into, uh, into JavaScript, which meant that you had kind of a limited subset of the Java API available to you. Since we're running on the JVM, it means that you kind of get everything that the JVM offers. You can uh, work with alternative languages. I heard several of Scala developers here. We have a lot of Scala developers in our company too. Kotlin, 
Uh, we have a DSL for that. One of our uh, developers wrote that. Uh, any kind of testing uh, tools, any kind of profilers, anything that IDs that you like, you can use with Vaadin. We take care of making sure that Vaadin works in all the browsers that we support. So we run thousands of tests every night, even down to like comparing screenshots of the components between different permutations of operating systems and browsers, making sure that like things just work. So if you build your application, you don't have to like spend a whole a lot of time just trying to figure out like why doesn't this thing work in, in Edge or whatever. The browsers that we support are IE11 and up, and then any actual browser. Vaadin <laughs> 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 um, is also built to be extendable. So obviously, even though we come with a very big library of components, we can't like fit everyone's every need in the world. We already took a look at some of the ways we can extend Vaadin. Like for instance, we extended one of the base components and added some uh, uh, functionality to it. We called some JavaScript APIs in it. Uh, we can also take any existing like web components or JavaScript components and just give them a Vaadin API very simply through this element API. And since it's an open source project, there are a lot of community contributed uh, ready-made components if you don't feel like doing it yourself. So if you need like a Google map component or charting library or whatever you need, there's a very good chance that somebody's already done that work for you and you don't have to actually do it yourself. All right, in closing, a couple words on, on Vaadin as a company. We've been around for about 18 years, I think now. Uh, we have kind of always had the focus on building apps on the web in Java. We're originally a Finnish company, like I'm, and I'm from Finland. Uh, the name itself means reindeer in Finnish, so that's where the logo comes from. Uh, if you like the logo, we have some laptop stickers over here. You can come and grab them afterwards. We have offices in, besides Finland, we have one in uh, Berlin and one in California, where I live. The way we make money is essentially mostly based on professional services, so people, companies who need help with like building a custom component or help augmenting their team, building a Vaadin application or getting training, stuff like that. Uh, that's kind of our bread and butter right there. We do have a couple of commercial add-ons that we offer, for instance, a charting library or a kind of drag and drop UI builder tool for kind of cranking out forms on an on a assembly line. If you're interested in checking it out, uh, you can go to the starter page that I used when I got started with the app there, uh, vaadin.com slash start. And with that, I'll open up for questions. Yes, sir. Um, what state are you storing on the, on the server side? Like if you take the Vaadin app you ran and you scale it up to like five instances, is there like session state where you're keeping like where, how does, it, how does that work? Yeah, so it's, Vaadin uses the session for storing state. So typically, in a kind of Vaadin setup, you would use a sticky session. So you kind of just route people to to one instance. That's kind of the easiest way. You can you can do replication, but it tends to be kind of n not. The, oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Uh, it's using that yeah. Session. Yeah. And typically, like the session is still like fairly lightweight. So especially if you're building something that's like more internal facing or something that's like less than a couple of tens of thousands of like users, it's, it's really not a big deal scaling stuff. If you're building kind of the next Gmail kind of uh, scale, then this probably isn't the best tool for that. But, but yeah. Yes, uh, we'll take. Does Vaadin function offline? Let's say for their chat app, we lost our internet connection. You know, could we send the message and then when like, if there was no internet connection, would it be too bad? Or would it store the message until it got a connection and then send it and then update it? Chat. So at, at this moment, with uh, with the API that we have, like that we use right now, it's only working off uh, online. You could define an offline fallback page so you could have a nicer experience when somebody does go offline. Uh, but that's really that's going to be one of the big themes for us next year is adding better support for progressive web applications, and we really want to become kind of the easiest way, way for somebody on a JVM stack to build a really great progressive web app. So that's something that you should definitely kind of check out. Yes, sir? Do you guys support SaaS out of the box as well, or is that something that's more like community contributed? Uh, we used to, like up until Vaadin 8, we used to use SaaS. But now we're 
we switched over to using CSS custom properties and uh, just kind of, it gives us most of the kind of same functionality without having to require a separate build step in between. So you can still have like send globally defined variables and stuff, but yeah. Right. Uh, not completely standalone, or at least as, as like as far as I know, you can't run like the the backend part of an Electron app needs to be Node. Of course, you could kind of render, just use it as a, a frame to render to, but in that case, it would be probably easier to use, just kind of do like a installable PWA, for instance, which would be a much lighter weight option than wrapping it in Electron. I think I had a question behind you as well. It's my Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm not um, sure. So the, the, the case would be, say, you, back when I was doing it uh, with Web Toolkit, we had a, uh, our API had to be in C. Yeah. So we would just then uh, using it to display the browser. And a mod would be if you wanted to host it in a CDN yeah. following Lambda function or something. Sure. Uh, do that, or do you really need the back end server? So if, if you're using the Java API, it's going <laughs> to run on the server. Uh, but like I said, you can use all the same components. So if you if you want to build an entirely like client side application that doesn't have any connection to a server that could call any kind of serverless functions or anything that could be done and you could kind of do the exact same application but then you couldn't take advantage of that Java API. Cool. Yes, sir. Uh, do you map any of the browser's APIs like the storage APIs or the database that exist in the browser so I can write Java code and like store stuff there and cache it, things like that? Uh, that's also a part of the kind of upcoming PWA support stuff that you can you can through the kind of JavaScript and interop APIs you can do that but like since it doesn't really run offline if you build it this way as a as a Java API uh, it it's not as useful right now to our users as it will be in the future. Yes. Uh, how long did it take for you to write that chat app the first time? Well. I don't remember. It definitely took longer than this. Like, pe uh, what people don't necessarily realize is that in order for live chat, live hacking to kind of be be not painful to look at, it needs to be fairly choreographed. <laughs> uh, it, it didn't take that long because just because I, I've been I've been working at Vaden for like eight years, I, I I pretty much know the framework inside and out. So I. I had a vision and I knew how to build it like it. All right. Um, this is my Twitter handle. So if you come up with good questions afterwards, you can feel free to uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'll also hang out here after it, uh, after the talk. So if you want to come and like grill me some more, feel free to do that. And yeah, thanks. Thanks guys for hosting me. And